Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are in the world. Welcome uh, to webinar number two, and it's on partial dentures. So this is what we're talking about for the next hour is uh, partial dentures and my approach to them. Um, now, what I um, uh, would like you to do, if you have any questions, please pop it into chat. And I, what I will do is I will look at those questions right at the end of the um, this webinar, and then I'll work my way through all of those questions as best I can. I'll spend about half an hour doing that. As, as needed. So thank you very much, it's great. This webinar also will be recorded. So I'm recording it just now. I'll just double check that I am doing that. Yes, it is. So I'm going to record this and then tomorrow I will pop it onto YouTube and also onto Facebook as well. So you can look at that too. So let's dive straight in. Let's get on with the case. So what I want to do is to, um, is to show you this first patient. This is, a, this is Olga and she has a, an upper partial denture, but it's almost like a complete denture because if we have a look in her mouth, in the maxilla, this is what she's got. So. I've noticed that um, someone's raised their hands there. Now, I won't be, um, uh, there's, there's too many people to actually answer questions for part way through the presentation. So just pop it into chat and I will answer your questions right at the end. Anyway, so this is back to Olga here. Now she's got this one single molar at the top there and it's in good shape, it's solid, and it's gonna be there for many years. But how do we cope with this? What type of a denture would you do for this patient? Just thinking about it, if they were in the chair now. This is what she had in place, Olga. It's like a classic acrylic-based denture, and it used to have, just here, there used to be a wire coming around a wrought stainless steel wire that's obviously broken off. Um, this this thing is just not retentive at all. Let's let's have a look at Olga now talking, and you might not be able to hear her talking particularly well, but just watch when I press play on the video how the denture bobbles up and down while she's talking. She's gonna tell us about this experience she had with a cheese sandwich. So she bit into a cheese sandwich and then there the teeth were in the cheese sandwich. Just watch this. Watch out, move sandwich. up and down. You know, I, I went up oh, and there were a cheese sandwich on the table <laughs> looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> so really really embarrassing so you know how do we get around this you know what is the restoration that we can do that actually helps us with this well this is the type of denture that is absolutely fantastic for this it's, I call it a window denture, and it's something that Professor Fraser McCord taught me years ago at Manchester, at the dental school. Now, what we, it has a, it's basically, if we have a look at the denture itself, if I turn, take it out and we have a look at it there, then you will see that there's a hole just there for the tooth itself, that single molar just fits in through that area there. And it's, that helps to hold the denture in place. 
The other thing that you'll notice as well, just on here, there is this bit there, and that is where there's a, a maxillary torus as well. So we've actually created a bit of space over that to prevent the denture from rocking on that torus. This is just something quite different as well. And if you look at my screen here, this is what we do with maxillary tori. We put tin foil onto the model, onto the cast, and then Rowan, my technician, makes the denture and makes it fit. And um, so we have, it's not resting on that torus and that prevents the denture from rocking like that. But anyway, let's now focus on the business end, which is that where we've got the, um, the hole here. If we have a close look at this, importantly, we have a ring around here of Moloplast B silicone. It's the same material that I use for soft lining dentures, and that goes into the undercut around that tooth there just by one millimeter, just into that undercut around the whole of that tooth. And it acts like an O ring around the tooth. It's absolutely superb. So you can see this here is Olga's mouth, a cast of the mouth and the Moloplast B just fits into that part of the undercut. It doesn't go any further down here or down here. It's just at the top, but that just helps to grip that tooth and hold it in place. So, and this is what the denture looks like as I superimpose it on that particular tooth there. It's fantastic. It just goes round that tooth and it grips it beautifully. So let's have a look at Olga now with that new denture in. And she's teasing me about, can I eat pork scratchings with this denture? Now, pork scratchings are, are an English British snack that we like having and they're very hard. And she's teasing me, can I eat those with these false teeth? And watch when she's laughing and talking, how secure and stable the denture is. That's great. So, and they are really, really good, these things. So now one thing I do mention to the patient, both I tell them about this both verbally and also in written format in their letter that the window will accelerate the de demise of the tooth because it surrounds the tooth completely like that. So it covers it completely and that goes against our periodontal principles of keeping the gingival margin free. However, if that tooth, the support tooth does fail, we can always remove the, extract the tooth and add a tooth onto the denture, which means that um, it is serviceable for the future. And the patient's also developed neuromuscular control and that adapted to this denture. So I just want to point out some features of this denture here. Now we've, We've used the, this system for years, and we found that incorporating metal, so it's a metal plate with mesh that connects up to this metal ring rest that fits over that tooth. We found that this is more robust and it avoids cracking and splitting and breaking of the prosthesis because I hate it when dentures break because patients, their confidence level with the prosthesis just drops off if their denture breaks. So, however, if we're working under more, um, if our financial constraints or there are financial constraints, 
in, in the setting that we work, then these work really well. These, this is an acrylic based version. Everything is just the same about this denture, apart from it doesn't have the metal framework incorporated inside it. But the round here, that where it fits around the tooth, we've, also, we've still got the moloplast uh, ring around there that helps to grip and hold that tooth. The other thing I think is really important to mention is I've done 36 of these types of dentures over the past 13 years. So that's an audit of the cases that I've treated. I've only had to extract one tooth and add it onto a denture out of all of those 36 cases. And I think it's probably due to my case selection for these cases. So if that tooth there was really wobbly, you know, like grade two, grade three mobile, I would elect to remove that first and then make a conventional complete denture for the patient. Just like all of my presentations over the next um, four weeks, they are all on my website. There's loads of resources there. Please just go there. Go to finlaysutton.co.uk slash speaking. There are papers in there that are really useful. If, if When you go to that page, you click on speaking. So this is at finlaysutton.co.uk. Click on speaking, scroll down that page. So if you just go further down, and then you'll find amazing partial dentures. A PDF of this whole presentation is in there. So you can download that and have a good look at it. And also, the nice thing is you'll be able to show your technician all of the, um, the, the pictures and slides. And there's lots of other really useful um, resources like a design sequence for removable partial dentures. Uh, the design sheet, and also a really lovely paper written by a Swedish prosthodontist describing this hygienic, this Scandinavian approach to partial dentures, which I'm going to delve into today, which is really good. So these are the seven pillars, the important things that I'm going to be talking about throughout today's presentation uh, over the next hour. So all of these things, if we get all these things right, then we, I end up with a really successful denture. So I want to now just move to Fraser McCord now. He was a, a real um, fantastic teacher for me years ago, and he gave me a big kick up the bum when he first saw the quality of work that I was doing. Um, and then this was about 20 years ago. I was rubbish at prosthodontics, but it was like that Dunning-Kruger effect. I thought I knew loads of stuff, but I knew very little. And I went and he, he took me on that journey to improving what I could do. Now, one thing that stuck in my mind about Fraser though, he always said to me, Finlay, regard free end saddles on partial dentures just like a complete denture. So make sure, like we've got Bert here in the chair with his complete denture that I can push against. If we've got free end saddles, like Kennedy class one, Kennedy, Kennedy class two, free end saddle designs, we want to have that distal extension just like a complete denture to maximize the support from the tissues. So Dave here is a classic example of this and I'll show you exactly what we did for Dave. Yeah, so this is David pre-treatment with these dentures in. He's got a partial upper, partial lower, acrylic based. Let's have a look in his mouth. So he's got upper and lower acrylic based dentures, poor fitting. What he needs to do here is when he eats and goes for a meal, 
he has to take them out, clean them off, put some more fixative, some glue on and put them back in. And this is a constant problem moving all over the place. Let's take these teeth out and have a look in his mouth there. So now those, the up, he's got, if you look in the upper arch, we've got two massively heavily restored teeth there. So I elected to get those out and do a full upper denture. Now, but in the lower arch here, we've got some teeth remaining and I love teeth. I want to keep them. They're so important, so precious to us. They work so much better than implants because they've got periodontium, which gives feedback to the brain. They're just wonderful. So if we can keep them, then that's great. But looking at the teeth here, we've got a totally unrestored seven or posterior molar. And then we've got a Nyar core, big amalgam, root filled, good bone levels, moderately restored premolar with a DO amalgam, and then a heavily restored canine and then edentulous everywhere else. This is his lower denture that he has at the moment. It's underextended in the retromolar pads. It's not particularly well adapted. There are gaps here where food can get in and it's wedged in between this area. Just now, do, whilst you're doing this webinar, just think about Dave. If you had him in the chair now, how would you design a partial denture for him? If you had these teeth remaining there, just think in your mind what you would do. This is what we decided to do for him. So, and I'll just talk you through this design. So we've got a ring rest around that back molar tooth with a chrome cobalt clasp coming off it. The X means retention. So in general, I use two clasps per denture. So an X there and an X there. And we've got support from that tooth, that natural tooth there. The Nyar core, we're going to use as an overdenture abutment. The canine, root fill that, use that as an overdenture abutment. So we've still got our lovely periodontal ligament giving our brain, giving Dave's brain feedback. And, and then we're going to extend the denture all the way around here right up the retromolar pad just like Dr. Arbe talks about in his superb uh, mandibular suction effective dentures and also we're going to potentially we may need who knows implants here and here but we chose not to do that we chose just to go with this basic design lovely reinforced chrome design so let's move on now so this is prior to me taking a definitive impression for David. So I've tidied up these teeth. So I've smoothed down that Nyar core right down to gum level. It's root filled and it's a lovely um, platform. This tooth here, the canine, we've root treated that and then put a composite filling in the top here, just covered that over. So that's going to be a over denture abutment. I want to take a lovely impression of the whole area. And when I took this impression, I used Imprigum in a special tray for Dave. So that's the special tray. You can see it, the design here, I'm holding it up. It's actually, this is from Dave's mouth, that model. And what I do is I board and mold all of this edentulous area like that in exactly the same way as I would do for a complete denture. And I will be talking about that specifically at webinar three next week, how to border mold for a complete denture. 
So, and I've also captured all of the teeth here in Imbrigon beautifully here. So, but this is just like a complete denture. So, so this would be visit two for David. Well, let's move to visit three for doing the jaw registration stage for Dave here. So in his upper arch, he has a wax rim in place. So he's got a wax rim in place in the mouth like that. And I've carved it. So I've carved my lip support first, according to a photograph of him when he had his natural teeth. I've carved the incisal plane parallel to the interpupillary line. So that's number one. If we move to the right, I then carve the alotragus, the rim, parallel to the alotragus. And I use a wallpaper scraper, a Harris wallpaper scraper, just heated in a Bunsen to do this. Now, whilst I'm, in terms of looking at lip support, if you look at Dave on the right there in the surgery, he has a rim, a wax rim in place at the top here. So, and I've carved that to give him lip support, which was similar to his lip support when he was in his 20s. So there's a photograph of him when he's about 21 and then on the right when he's in his 60s. But interesting, look at the difference in the length of the upper lip here. Look how the upper lip has grown with Dave here. And this is what happens to all of us as we age, our upper lip gets longer. And as a result, we show less teeth. So the relative incisal edge position of the tooth remains the same, but the upper lip grows. And if you look at photographs like this of patients, you see it all the time. It's amazing. So I've got to think about that when I'm carving the incisal edge position as well. So, and this is a dentate picture that um, Dave brought in. That dentate picture, he didn't like the appearance of his natural teeth from that, particularly the upper centrals, the way they were. So we actually made it, we changed it when we actually came to do the try and finish teeth. So that's the carved rim. Now this here, that information goes to Rowan. It's really important, both photographs go to Rowan, and then he can then arrange the teeth beautifully on this um, wax rim that we've carved, just like that. So, and just have a good look at this now. Let's have a look closely at what Rowan has done. So, now the upper central incisors, we've made those more upright compared to these here, but we've kept the same angle or position of lateral incisors. So the laterals are just sitting slightly behind the centrals. And if you notice, he's got quite, Dave's got a gummy part here. So those two teeth look quite gummy. So what we've done is just brought the gum level up around those teeth too. And it just changes his aesthetic appearance. So this is visit four. And we can verify the occlusion at visit four, make sure that's fine. And then from this, we can engineer the Chrome framework to fit into within the try-in. So this is prosthodontically driven chrome fabrication. Very important part of the process. So in many of my cases, I will go to a try-in first and then make the chrome afterwards and then finish it. Really important detail. So here we've got Dave's lower partial denture in place. It's fantastic. So we've got the ring rest, on the back, we've got overdenture abutment, we've got two support, we've got a clasp here, and then, but we've got this lovely, beautiful extension all the way up the retromolar pad. It's fantastic. So looking at that, so the where we've got the edentulous saddle, 
that is just like a complete denture, the fitting surface. So, and let's, so here we've got the denture itself. So we've got two clasps, one in chrome from that ring, and then we've got a gold eye bar, which is embedded into the acrylic work here of that denture, and then extended all the way up the retromolar pad, covering the retromolar pad in that way, just like Dr. Arbe design. It's fantastic. So all of this, the, the tongue and the cheek sit over that and hold that denture in place on that side in David's mouth. And this is what David said about his teeth. I'm no longer aware of them. And I bump into Dave. I live in Lancaster and he lives in Lancaster too. I see him quite regularly in town. And I like the fact that when I bump into him, it doesn't look like a denture, his teeth. And look at the lower incisors too. They're a little bit imbricated too. It's just lovely. I really like that too. So I just want to pay tribute to my technician, Rowan, who I work with. Rowan works in the room next door to me. I've worked with him for 20 years. He's fantastic. Chris Hesketh makes all of the chromes that we fit for our patients. And he works in Chorley, just down the road. He's, his work is magnificent. And Chris's son has just started working with us at the practice. And he has been with us for just over six months now. And he is so talented too. I'm very, very fortunate. Um, so having a great technician is absolutely the key to this whole process. It's fantastic. And what I really enjoy actually, part of the, one part of the job that I particularly love is sitting with an articulator and looking at some models with Rowan and working out how we're going to design and plant a denture properly. So Rowan and I have come up with um, this design sequence, which you, you can download from the website, from the speaking section of the website. It's a sheet here that's got every single step to follow. And um, if, if I follow every single step on here, then I know I'm not going to miss some vital component within the denture design sequence. Um, and I think one of the most important parts of the whole thing is, is number five, which is the one in the middle, is that it's planning for the future. You know, what happens if, if we make a partial denture and the person loses a tooth, you know, and it's a chrome denture, can we add to it? So that's something just to think about. I'll talk to you about that in a, later. And then the other thing that I love doing as well is designing and colouring in. So I use these pens here. And what I love doing is it's like an adult colouring in, grown up colouring in. And it just makes me relaxed. My blood pressure goes down and it's a lovely part of my day is designing one of these chrome uh, dentures. But also the great thing is that it gives the technician clarity for, um, for designing uh, to actually produce the denture. You can download this from the website to a blank copy. This was actually drawn by John Besford, my mentor, and he always liked big designs like this. Fantastic. So let's move on. Pat. So I want to introduce Pat to you. I treated Pat about 12, 12 years ago, and she's got in her upper arch a full upper denture, and it's supported on implants at the top. The upper denture's an implant-supported denture. In the lower arch, she's got lower anterior teeth, and on the lower right-hand side here is a free-end saddle. It's a Kennedy class one denture. Let's have a look at it from above. So here's the denture itself. It extends up. The this is the free-end saddle section here. And this is 
like a classic RPI system. And I really don't like the RPI system. I had real problems with predictability. I think we should just leave it now because we've got a much better solution to uh, the RPI system. So now with, and I had real problems with these dentures and, and Pat in particular is one of these cases where when she was, and she's a Bruxist, she's really heavy on her teeth and she's got a really secure upper denture. When she was biting on this saddle area here, on the right hand side, she would, it, the RPI system allows it to sink into that area. There, this free end saddle bit here. And she got constant soreness underneath the denture in that area. It rubbed always. And I just found that my partial dentures were unpredictable and i had a, a referral practice patients were paying a lot of money for these partial dentures that we were spending ages making and they just my patients weren't as happy as i wanted them to be so and then and this would be 10 years ago i went on a course run by Charlotte Stillwell. And she totally, her, her teachings changed my approach completely. She'd been trained, she's Danish and works in London. And she'd been trained in Copenhagen using a Scandinavian uh, design system for partial dentures. And uh, was taught by Bengt Erval, who was a Swedish prosthodontist. And, so she learned this whole sequence and technique and it was just fantastic. And I'll share it with you that just in a second. And I've also learned a lot from two people in a study club that I'm with. So John Bessford, who I'm just gonna put a halo on his head there. And also Linda Blakely as well. So well, these three people were just knew this system beautifully. So, and so once I'd been and learnt from Charlotte, we went from that RPI system to this system, which is the Scandinavian approach, where we've got using much, much more tooth support to actually make the denture as stable as possible. And rather than little dainty rests, we've got big ring rests that sit over the tooth, just like that. And, and then two clasps, in general, per partial denture. And a good chunky lingual bar here. So it is rather like a Kennedy bar, but it's a really big chunky one, like a resin bonded bridge. So I went, came back and I actually treated um, Pat again in the practice and I gave her a new denture. We started again with this. So you can see how it's lovely support from these anterior teeth, big chunky lingual bar or a sublingual bar, ring rest around the back here. So I think they're a bit like removable resin bonded bridges you know if you turn them round and have a look at them they are really big chunky designs they there's a lot of metal work but that metal work is tucked away behind the teeth down at the back a really rigid solid chassis chunky so so this was about 10 years ago that I did this course and it totally changed my approach. Now I've been brought up with the McCracken's approach, the RPI system, and I found that I had on average, before I did changed, four reviews per patient. So, and then when I moved to the Scandinavian approach, and this is a textbook that describes it quite nicely here. When I moved to this approach, 
I had two reviews per patient. And also it was just, they were just more comfortable, more secure, more better tolerated, and also more hygienic too, just way better. And there's so much research around this. Um, and the Scandinavians have got 40 to 50 years of evidence to show that this type of design system works beautifully. So any of our colleagues from the Scandinavian countries that are listening now will understand this approach really well. Um, and I'm wanting to everyone around the world to really look at this carefully and think, is it worth considering? Because I do think it is. So the, the basic underlying rule to this is it's a three millimeter rule where the important gingival margin round here where the tooth erupts from the gum, we keep any componentry of the denture away from that critical junction between the uh, gum and the tooth. And the, the thing about this is that there's long-term evidence and data to show that this type of design results in less plaque accumulation, so less periodontal problems and less caries underneath. I've, I've actually, on my website, I've, I've actually put this paper that summarizes it and you can download that. And in the paper, it's got quite a nice little uh, design sequence here to show you how this three millimeter rule works there. It's quite interesting. So now, so since doing this, I've changed my whole approach. And this is, this is um, Sheila, who I treated 13 years ago uh, when I first started the referral practice. She's got milled crowns, or these have got guiding surfaces and rest seats here and on that premolar there. And I made her a, a plate denture like this at the time. She was a periodontal patient and um, we'd taken out some teeth and made her this plate. Now, but looking at this plate now on the back of that Scandinavian research and Charlotte's teachings, it makes my head hurt looking at it, it's horrible. And this is what I've done for Sheila since then. I've changed it to this lovely open design. And where if we look here, she can get TPs between all of the interdental embrasures with the denture in place. You can see it's all free and open to the saliva. So, so this is what we did. Now, it's important to tell the patient though, in these circumstances, if we're going from a plate design to a, an open design, this hygienic design, food will pack in and collect in these open embrasures at the start. But with time, the patients, all of my patients adapt to this new thing and the tongue gets used to clearing the food away and also manipulating the bolus to prevent the food from packing in. It's quite important. But I, I really do feel that we should be adopting this approach worldwide in terms of our partial denture design. I think it's, it's really that important and, and I found it so successful. So I want to move on to talk about Ken now, and this is lower free end uh, saddle bilateral. So this is a Kennedy class uh, two uh, lower partial denture that we did for Ken. Now, in practice, I'm seeing increasingly um, implants failing. Look at that there. This is a, a noble biocare replace select implant on a, a bridge. So that's the failing implant here at the back and it's connected to that implant in the premolar region. So, so with Ken, what I did was took that out, sectioned the bridge, and you can see here, that's the rest seat. I've made a rest seat in this implant crown and also made rest seats in these really old crowns that were linked together. There's an old post here, old post crown, very short post in that. So I sectioned that and smoothed it down to gum level. 
and then took out a pontic here and then so we've got this big freehand saddle areas let's put his chrome denture in so i treated um i, I treated ken years ago and it's just been so successful it's fantastic it extends all the way up the back big fully extended all the way back lovely support from these teeth for, with this dental bar and then this lingual bar underneath and then two clasps on the denture so it looks like if we actually turn it round, have a look from the back he's he's had periodontal disease and he's got attachment loss um, but it's now stable he can clean with interproximal brushes beautifully there and it's so solid and robust and let's have a look at it in the mouth watch this when i put my finger on it there is no sinking or rocking you know like the rpi system it's meant to go in this is solid and secure because it's so well and beautifully supported by the posterior teeth so it worked so well supported by the teeth themselves and the free end saddles and those extensions so let's move on now so i want to now talk about this is point number five on my design sequences what happens when we lose a tooth now i don't have a crystal ball and in terms of how long teeth are going to last but i don't want to take them out unnecessarily so and this is something i think i have to think about with my patients all the time so in this case this is rosemary um, now rosemary's lower front teeth some of these particularly those three here are a bit dog-eared they've got big restorations they're a bit fragile not great so we made of this denture to start with and then that tooth there needed to that actually snapped and we needed to take it out so with this design because we've got a dental bar on the back what chris can do my technician he can weld a tag onto the dental bar and then a and then rowan can fit a tooth onto that welded tag just like that um, and then this means that the denture is future proof and then eight years later that tooth went so rowan added another tooth onto the denture and then nine years later the canine needed to come out as well so rowan added a tooth on here we've also relined this area of the denture rowan kept the gold clasp that was just part of that flange and we also added a clasp in stainless steel wire little l-shaped clasp there so we've got a clasp here and a clasp still there so this is nine years down the line it's now 11 years since i've made this denture it's working beautifully still so you, obviously um, rosemary paid a lot of money for that prosthesis to start off with but it's still future proof and this prevents us having to make new dentures later on some of you will be thinking flipping heck what if we have gaps between the teeth though you know so if we've got gaps between the front teeth like here for this patient sue then we can't bring the dental bar around the front there so sometimes we can bring a strut up if need be but if we've got enough support from these two teeth either side then this is the design that i would go for in this case so really trying to avoid covering the gingival margins and it's also the other thing is that these front teeth for sue she's unlikely to lose those in the future because they are unrestored and not periodontally involved so and it's really really important this design process like this lady julie presented to me like this 
So she's got those missing teeth there. Let's have a look in her mouth. She had the uh, a bridge, three unit bridge here. And then, so these root filled teeth have snapped in half. Let's have a look up here. So she's got the snap teeth at the front there. And then she's got these nice little attachments here and here for a denture like this. Look at that. And you know, nice precision attached denture. It's working really well, but with no provision for addition in the future. And if Julie had had, a that, so that lovely fitting denture is redundant. If she'd had a design like this with the metal backings on all of these upper front teeth there, then that bridge could have, it would have protected the bridge in the first place with the backings. But if the bridge failed, we can add the teeth onto the denture and she's still got this denture to work with. So. Next, what I want to do now is just to share with you um, this. This is so important, this particular technique, um, which is so useful for free and saddles. And so it's developed by Jim Brudvig, which are composite rest seats on these teeth. So if you look here, we can put composite on the lingual surfaces of these lower front teeth. And then the chrome framework fits over those like this there and that chrome framework fits into those composites and helps to support the denture so let's have a look at a lower incisor from the side now in the past i would have cut in a rest seat into a lower incisor but this is this goes against all of my you know, we're cutting through enamel interdenting, definitely, because they've got very thin enamel in these areas. So rather than doing this, I put composite on like that. So I bond it on. And that composite then allows the framework to fit over the tooth. We make the framework fit onto the tooth, the metal backing. And this resists distal movement of the free end saddle and also resists it from sinking so we get support from that so these are just like climbing wall hooks for the denture um, and they, they are fantastic the wonderful things um, so you can see them here in place so this is elaine's mouth here we've got a composite on here composite there composite there and that so all we are doing on the canines and the, the lower incisors, we're accentuating the cingulans. So if, if you've not done these before, then I think this is quite a neat way of doing them to start off with whilst you get used to doing them. It's ask the technician to wax up exactly where we want these um, rest seats to go. So the night accentuating the cingulans, and then the technician will duplicate this cast into a hard model like that, and then make a pull down like a whitening tray, pull down over the top of that. And then we can then take this to the mouth. So we can use this pull down as a matrix to put composite in like that, and then take it, etch so we get the teeth we sandblast etch bond and then push this over the teeth like that push it right down and then zap it through it just like you would do for invisalign it's like the opposite way to invisalign like that zap it remove and then what i use is a, a tapered crown prep burr like a chamfer crown prep burr, and then just reshape them, take away the flash, and then I polish it with an enhanced finishing burr, a dense blight enhanced finishing burr. And so I do this regularly, it's just absolutely superb. You can see how clearly in this casting here, 
they fit over those lovely rest seats. They are amazing. And they don't come off, by the way. Um, it's a question that I get asked regularly. Do these composites come off? And I've been doing this for 10 years now since Charlotte's course, and I've had to replace one of them. And only one. And I think that they don't come off particularly because the the way the metalwork fits on the edge of the teeth here, just the dentures just don't move and they're not loading the composite particularly. But if they do come off, it's quite easy because we've got the matrix there, which is in the denture itself. So we can put composite in, etch and bond the tooth, fit the denture, light cure, through the teeth and around, take off the denture and then zap it from the outside, so directly, and then just make sure that the denture fits over the top using occlude spray. I'll show you this in a minute, occlude spray, to make the whole denture fit properly. So, now, some of you will be thinking, how, how on earth do we get that lovely detail on those impressions with and the, so we've got models with these lovely rests and things and all of that detail on there this is how I do it so I board and mold the saddles with green stick so if we have a tray there so I put green stick on the, all of the saddle here apart from on the retromolar pad I keep it free of the retromolar pad just there and there so that's off so we've got green stick on here and i mold the green stick i put it in the mouth like that and i mold the cheek firmly pulling the cheek whilst holding the tray down firmly in the mouth both sides and then i get the patient to really stick their tongue out and lick their upper lip Right, so that moulds the lingual section all the way around beautifully. So, and actually next week on webinar three, I will show you precisely how I work with green stick. So it's dead easy to use. So do that first. And now we are then ready to do an impression in that in alginate. So but one thing's really important is and it doesn't show on this here, we need to have perforations over where we've got the teeth. So we need to have this perforated so that the impression material goes through the holes and locks in. So I'm going to do a wash and alginate there. So lots of adhesive all over the tray. Let that dry. And then we can then mix up, we mix up the alginate lovely and smooth and then do this. So this is really important. This is the impression. I'm just about to do an impression here. So I've got in my hand, the impression tray. On my finger, I've got some alginate. I'm gonna take that and I'm going to rub the alginate on the finger into the rest seats and the occlusal surfaces of the teeth first. I've dried those teeth as well beforehand. So I rub that right in and then I've got in my tray, I've got the alginate and I've glazed that with water. Take that to the mouth, rotate it in, sit it down onto the saddles. Just stick your tongue right out. Stick your tongue out. Stick your tongue out. And lick your lip. Lick your lip. Really So that's what we do. So I'll just I'll talk you through the whole process. So rotate the tray in. This is with the alginate in. Seat it down onto the saddles. And then get the patient to stick their tongue out, really stick the tongue out so that the alginate's pushed up firmly against the green stick, lick the upper lip, and then I then keep hold of it down and mold the cheeks, both sides, and mold the cheek at the front there. 
as well. This is quite different than doing a edentulous impression where I do the Dr. Arbe five sequences of E, U, lick the lip, push against the lower front teeth with the tongue and swallow. I, I don't do that for partials. I want to do it the old fashioned way because the front teeth, those front teeth get in the way of border molding it properly. So it's properly pulling the cheeks up. And this produces a lovely impression. They just, they come out really beautifully. Inside here, we've got all of the detail needed. It's in shadow on this photograph there, but I get great detail. And also the free, look at these lovely free end saddles here, border molded, and then come round to the front here. This is sticking the tongue out, importance, freedom. That freedom is recorded. The pushed out version of the freedom is recorded there. And then we've got all of this lovely denture bearing tissue. It's fantastic. So that's how to do how I do the impressions. Now moving on to the chrome framework. So if I have a chrome framework like here, this is ALF's framework that I need to try in when we get back to work. So if I had ALF sitting in the chair now and I was going to try this framework in, most of the time the frameworks don't fit perfectly straight away. There's, they never quite go in. So this is what I do. I use occlude spray. We've got loads of that. I, have, I just get through loads of it with my dentures. And what I do is I spray it onto the fitting surfaces where it's going to touch the teeth. I then take the framework to the mouth and gently push it in place. And I want to just get it to rock and I want to get it to sit as good as possible. And then I take it out and have a look at it. And where it rubs off, see these areas here at the back, can you see where it's rubbed away? Here and there. And if we move across to here and here, here, a little bit there, incidentally here and there, I will use that bird that's on the screen there to just adjust those areas, just like that. So essentially what I'm trying to do is I do not, I almost, I never touch this area here like that. This junction there, I only adjust above this line there because if I touch where I've indicated it here in red, I can create gaps. So it's very, very important. This is, it applies to both acrylic fitting and also to chrome fitting. Never adjust this area here. Very, very important point. So now I, what I want to do now is just to share with you a case completely. I'm just going to change from start to finish here. So here we've got Angie. So now Angie's really heavy on the teeth. Let's have a look at these teeth there. So they're really worn down. She's been brook zinc on these teeth. It's a bit scary, this case. So let's have a look here from above. Now she was being seen by a colleague of mine originally. And my colleague was going to restore these worn teeth with palatal composites, lab made palatal composites, and then veneers. And then the posterior teeth here were going to be restored with dental implants. So this is what happened. So this is my colleague did this and restored these teeth here like that. But you know what? He found that this lateral incisor and this central incisor remained really wobbly. And he couldn't get 
good stability of these teeth. They had good periodontal support, but they remain wobbly. Let's have a look on this video here. I'll just see. Can you see on this video that tooth? It's got good periodontal support, but it's wobbly. And so my colleague was worried that, and also the patient was too, because it, this was uncomfortable, that this would continue if those posterior teeth were replaced with implants. So, and he said, please Finn, could you do one of your dentures for her that is like a splint as well as a denture? So, and this is Angela here in the chair, Angie. So, and this is when I first saw her and I noticed she was doing this. She was bruxing during the day as well. You can see her jaw automatically subconsciously moving to the side and pushing on that so she she's probably doing that at night and during the day too so and the, the great thing is about this case is that uh, we had the my colleague had placed these lovely singulum composites big chunky composites on these front teeth which meant that was just i could cut into those and make these lovely dimples to actually allow the partial denture to fit right into these teeth there and help to support the teeth. So you can see these lovely dimples on these um, teeth there, just like that. There. So, and that, this is a, it's rather like, at Stonehenge, we were on holiday and I saw that the this ancient monument from 10,000 years ago had the same engineering as this partial denture. So there we've got it. That, so this was the partial denture that we made. So it's like a splint, it just fits into the lingual surfaces of these teeth there. That's it in place. And it's a it's not only a denture it's a stabilization splint all of the occlusion from the lower teeth bite onto that denture so we've got now in order to give someone something like this which is like a stabilization splint particularly in a patient like this it's so it's really important that i restore them to centric relation so I used a gothic arch tracing system for um, this patient here to actually record central relation. So here it is in place. We've got the an upper plate and a lower plate. This fits in and onto the teeth there. And that pin here bites onto this plate in the mouth. And I so before I put it in and make it work, I put a China graph pencil down here, put this into the mouth, both together, and then get Angie to move from side to side. So she goes, and she can really go for it because she's so used to Brooke saying side to side, and then forwards and backwards, rather like this. Forwards, so forwards and backwards, and backwards, forwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, back. forwards, backwards, backwards. And then side to side. side to side. That's lovely. That's good. And then forwards and back. They're brilliant, these things. And then she makes an arrow. So this is center relation. Bang on the arrow, just there. That's CR. And then I put a little disc over that, take that to the mouth, and then fit it together in place. And then inject some futile D into that position, just like that there. So we've now recorded center relation perfectly, really well, just like this. There, and then it gets mounted. Sorry, I'll go back. We mount that on the articulator. The upper's mounted with a face bow. The lower's mounted to the upper using the central bearing apparatus, the Gothic arch tracing. And then we can then go to a try-in verify that fits and then finish so here's angie with the denture before and after there and interestingly the mobility 
actually reduced. And I, what I find is that the mobility reduces quite considerably post-operatively with these types of dentures. They are absolutely superb and really, really good. So I'm just looking at the time. I've just been, I'm doing a lot of waffling during this webinar. So I've got one case to show you now and then we will finish and I'll take questions. So, so this is another patient, Angela, um, who's got two, she's got missing front teeth. Really embarrassed about this. She's got a horrible, a horrible partial denture there um, that replaces those. It doesn't look great. Um, but this is her at the age of 12 with her brother and just before she fell off a horse and lost these teeth. So this is, this is Angela at the age of 12, just prior to um, this accident. So this is a, a lovely photo. If you look closely, she's got lovely, she's like class two, division two there, beautiful teeth. And then this is the acrylic based denture that she was wearing. And you can see that the teeth anterior teeth should follow this arc much further out here in order to give it a correct appearance or improve the appearance really. So I gave her two options and because she came to see me she wanted a life without a denture but I gave her two options which is either a partial denture metal base or a implant supported denture. So implant supported bridge or sorry implant supported fixed bridge or a partial denture so now in order to do the implant supported bridge we need to put block bone grafts in to replace those teeth there so i do a we did a a calculation to measure the central incisors which i'll go into in detail on webinar three next week and so, and we chose these teeth, 9.3 millimeter, which are quite big. Average incisors are, upper central incisors are 8.9 millimeters to 9.1. And this was the denture that we made for Angela. So, and this is important for technicians to be brave with tooth positioning. Here, look at that. How those are flared out there. And we've got, good support from the canines these two teeth are not restored they're unrestored so we keep the metal work away that's heavily restored and that is because they have we've got a crown an aperceptive tooth there so we've brought the strut forward so we can add a tooth on in the future there and we've also brought the strut forward and we can add a tooth on just there and so this was the partial dent that we made, and it's got a lovely thin flange anteriorly here to just replace, literally replace what is missing. That's all we're trying to do is put the teeth back where they were naturally. Lovely thin flange up here, class two div two, fits beautifully. Path of insertion is, um, Closes the path of insertion closes any gaps we've got here, there, and absolutely changed Angela's life totally with this. And you know, just putting the teeth back where they were naturally, she loves it. So the clasps are on the sevens right the way back. You see the gold crown on the upper left seven there. The tooth is clasped on the seven behind that. There. And this is, you know, fantastic. And it did totally change the way that she feels about herself. And it's only a denture. So, and then we've got, is she, could she avoided having this? Okay. I don't do any fixed prosthodontics at all now. I've just totally do dentures. That's because I love them. But this is my last ever implant fixed case and um, so a surgeon came and did the bone graft for me Paul Swanson did this 
and this is another patient, a different patient. But what I'm trying to say here is that um, uh, Angela avoided having this done. This is Simon. He had this done. He wanted each tooth replacing at the front there, you know, with months of work. And, and we replaced all of his front teeth there. His mum had, had kept these teeth that had been knocked out at the age of 17 and, and Simon was 50 when he came to see me. His mum had kept them, so we replicated those shapes in the final um, implant supported teeth. And this was the finished result. And, but just look at the gum above that. It just doesn't look like natural gum. And fortunately, Simon had a low smile line, which disguised this completely and so he didn't show that at all which is which is so lucky but what i'm trying to say is here i think that angela's denture at the top there looks much better than uh than simon's lower teeth there which are implant supported which have you know so i think that partial dentures potentially in the right hands can look better than any any other restoration um, to replace missing teeth. They're a fabulous way of doing things. So thank you very, very much indeed. I'm just going to go to the end slide. Thank you for listening. And um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have a good look through chat and then answer some questions for you here as we go. And if you're interested in joining me, for the other webinars i'm actually going to do partials again tonight and then i'm doing them twice um each tuesday so these are like tuesday webinars so let's have a look i'm gonna to go to chat now and have a good look at that and also what i'm going to do is i'm going to bring up my full screen so i'll stop screen sharing here and then you can see me here now and i need to get chat so i've got no one assisting so i just need to have a look there at now i need to find chat here we go and So I'm going to just go and have a look through here. So I'm going to go right to the end. That's good. Thank you very much. Um, so from Lucy Dunn to everyone, what is your approach if there is not enough inter-occlusal space? So this is really, it's a good question, Lucy. Now, the, Rowan says to me, I need more space. That's absolutely is most common thing so and this is really really important um is uh is is space so so for instance in that last case or like angela the the tooth wear case there then we can open that up and i'm quite happy about opening the bite up to give us enough space a 0.4 of a millimeter for the metal work so we can actually do that. Um, that's not a problem uh, at all, is jacking them open as long as we've got good tooth contacts everywhere else. Um, in terms of um, inter-occlusal space, if we've got attachments, and I'm, I've not talked about attachments either, so if we've got a denture like this with studs, sometimes I'll use Rhine attachments, we're always lacking in space for doing things like this and these can break very easily so it's um it's a real issue actually so is if we're lacking in space so hi finn very interested in using gothic tracing how do i go about getting into this and also will technicians be aware well i think it's a have a look at the documentation on the website. So just scroll down, look at the denture construction manual, look at this talk today, talk to your technician about it. The, 
the gothic arch system that I use, which is like this, um, that is a Swiss system called the Gerber Condolator system, and you can get that direct from Switzerland. And if you're a clinician, you can just keep that yourself and then send that to the technician and just work together getting used to it. So, how do you discuss chrome dentures for moderate severe perio cases? Now, these chrome dentures, this Scandinavian approach to denture design, which is all open beautifully like that, these are brilliant for perio cases because they act like splints, so they hold the teeth together, and often these teeth are wobbly. And also, the framework sits well above the gingival margin, allowing that saliva flow to go into that area. So they're absolutely terrific for these sorts of perio cases. How much of the tooth do you leave supra gingival when chopping down a tooth for an overdenture abutment? Not very much, Pasha. Um, Rowan, again, it's like, I need more space. So he has to have a tooth fitting onto that overdenture abutment. And if, if we've left it really high, say we've put a gold coping on, on that abutment, then there's only a, a little tiny bit of acrylic to go over the top of that. So these tend to snap for one. So it's, it, breakages are an issue. And secondly, if the tooth, the underlying tooth isn't low, the teeth, say, if you visualized a, a patient that just had retained canines, and we were gonna make an overdenture over retained canines there, if I didn't cut them down to gum level, then the patient's going to look quite toothy because we have to bring, we've often got to bring them further out because of the eminence of the tooth. And they often look a little bit too all tooth. So space is absolutely our premium. That's great. Thank you. Big up from Indonesia. Lovely. Love. Thank you. Um, that's great. Basil, Mark Bishop. Great work. Thanks again, Finn. Thank you, Mark. Um, Hassan Dadoop. How do you discuss chrome dentures for moderate severe perio cases? We've talked about that. Thanks a lot. What would you recommend? Any books for design, denture designing? So, yeah, that in terms of books, that's a good one there. This is a Scandinavian approach to um, removable partial dentures. That. But also, what I'd recommend is just having a look at my stuff on my website on the speaking page scroll down and there's loads of cases that i've documented in there and you can click on that and then it'll bring up the whole list of uh, and loads of different designs so you can just copy those if you want to so from how do you attach from Finley's left nut to everyone, whoever that is, I don't know. How do you attach the Gothic arch to the jaw reg? So it's, it's attached with wax onto the base, an acrylic base. Um, if, uh, if we're worried about that coming off, then Rowan will actually attach it with acrylic, will bead, um, pattern resin onto this to hold it in place, like Duralay, just to hold it on. So it's special tray material onto a definitive cast. Is anterior retention sufficient with the extended flange? So that's the, that will be looking at Angie's case, where we've got the clasps at the back and this anterior flange there. That anterior flange does add extra. Hi Yammer, I can see you. <laughs> so 
that extra flange does extend up and actually helps to retain the denture anteriorly. It does help beautifully with retention. How do you, Michael Davies, how do you place a crown on a clasping tooth? So if I incorporate a crown into, so if we've got a, a patient where we say need to put a crown here, then we would design the crown using a surveyor. So we'd have the crown shaped to allow the um, metalwork to fit over that dent, over the tooth with a path of, in, path of insertion on all the other teeth too. That's so Nizreen Ahmad says, why not do a fixed bridge anteriorly? And why not go for a fixed bridge anteriorly for the last case? That's a good question. I wouldn't do a fixed bridge on that case. I wouldn't do a Maryland because it's too big of a span, a Maryland bridge, but I certainly wouldn't do a fixed bridge by prepping those beautiful canines. Virgin canines, never been touched before. We could be destroying the enamel into the dentine and then we end up with potentially root treatment and losing those canines. I would physically, I would be crying inside myself if I drilled them. Um, Yem Lim, what is your take on novel flexi dentures? Um, flexible dentures are really bad for the periodontium that they are so against all of these Scandinavian principles that I've been talking about today. I only think that these flexible dentures are useful for temporary devices whilst implants are going in or a fixed restoration is going in. So Adeline, right, I'm increasingly getting patients allergic to metals requesting non-metal partials. Are there any newer plastics which can be designed similarly to your solid metal frameworks? <clears throat> yes, I, there are some other non-metal metal replacements that are coming on the market, which I have used, like Pecton and these other ones by Solvay. And I think they need to be designed in the same way as the Scandinavian approach. However, the materials do have to be a little bit thicker. But if I do get a patient who is allergic to this, I use the same design principles and then make them the metal base in Pecton currently. That's my current technique. I'm just looking at the time here. So I'm going to, I'll call it quits at half past two British summer time. To do. So in Angie's bruxism case, Yemlin, what would her nighttime regime be considering if she takes a denture out and still grinds her teeth? She actually wears this, she wears this denture at night too, and this is a stabilization splint. Um, in the lower arch, she has a soft bite guard. Um, restoring the posterior teeth will minimise the load on anterior, so we may do a transitional drenching to evaluate the anterior teeth and then we go for implant posteriorly. So Stuart Crook, can you go over the adjustments with the occlude spray again? Finley, child distracted me, sorry. Yeah, of course, Stuart. This is dead important. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and just here. I'm going to go to desktop one. I'm going to go to this and just bear with me. I will find the adjustment bit. This is really important. This is something that I was taught by Rowan. So, right, frameworks. So Chrome frameworks, 
they it's very rare that the framework will fit the mouth perfectly from when we take it out of the box from the lab so what i do is i spray occlude spray onto all the areas where it fits up against the teeth you see around here there so wherever it touches a tooth i spray that and then i take this to the mouth so take it to the mouth like that goes in sits down around the teeth there and then i take it out i try and make it i try, wiggle it in and then i look at it see where it's not fitting if it's not fully down take it out and then i work my way around and i adjust it where it's rubbed off so in these areas here 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 down here here and then try it back in but what i avoid doing stuart is this dead important i do not touch the part here that touches against the tooth i avoid that if at all possible but i can adjust anywhere above that area because if i adjust this edge here it will create a gap a bit like this with a, an acrylic partial denture so i never adjust this bit here around the edge i only adjust above that position just like that so it fits really nicely the whole thing so let's go i'm going to stop sharing my screen so hi again so when to do i know the palatal surface of the maxillary denture is not three millimeters away from the gingival margin is there a reason for that so that's a good question jaslyn patrick so now i don't want the I want the, if we've got the two, the denture sitting like this here on the back of these teeth there, what I don't want the margin, I don't want the metal work to pass the gingival margin. So it doesn't cross that gingival margin, but it's almost like a resin bonded bridge. So we, the three millimeter rule, I break it regularly for this particular reason, but it's finished like a knife edge, just like a resin bonded bridge in Maryland bridges. So it remains quite nice and clean. Is that so? These rule, rules are um, have to be broken sometime. To do. So this is another thing. So why not about the actual impressions material? So why alginate is your final impression material rather than silicone? I love alginate and it works really well in my hands. That's the thing uh, about it. Um, and But if you find as a clinician that you prefer using silicone and you're so used to using silicone use it it's fine but it's the same principles for the whole thing but if you are worried though that the alginate is going to remain unstable from the point of taking the impression and it going through to the lab and if your lab it you have to post it don't worry about it Modern alginates are dimensionally stable if they are looked after. So once the impression has been done and disinfected, then it goes, it gets rinsed with water and then a gauze placed over it and moistened gauze into a plastic bag. And then when it gets packaged in the box to get to go in the post, put bubble wrap all around it, seal it up, 
and it will be dimensional, dimensionally stable for five days like that. There's lots of alginates on the market that are great for that too. So I'm just going to go, I'll do one more question and then I'm going to play outside with my kids in the garden. So. So Isabel Burgess has asked, why do you glaze your alginate with water? That's a really good question because, so once I've um, mixed up my alginate and placed it in here, I glaze it with water. That has been proven to reduce the number of air bubbles by 50% on the alginate. So it's a really, really good thing. So, and then Blue Coop, um, one other question, are there any contraindications to adding the composite freehand? There are no contra contraindications to adding it by freehand. That's how I do it. I just do it freehand now. So I've just showed you that um, design, which is a little bit like using Invisalign. I think that's a great way of learning it. But if you're confident with doing it, Go for it, absolutely fine. That's great, so thank you very much. I'm just gonna have a look, see what's going on. That's good. That's brilliant. So, so we're asking about CPD. No, there's no CPD, sorry for the webinars. That's fine. So there's something about that. That's good. So, and Alessio Casucci, I'll do this one. Thanks, Finley. How do you consider the use of Facebook in removable prosthodontics? So, I've got some things here. So, I use Facebook all the time. It only takes five minutes to do it, and it just helps us to mount these, all of these things. It just, what I want is, I want Rowan to have the patient's head on the bench. So, and the face bow helps us to give, I want Rowan to have a simulator of the patient. So I use the face bow all the time. Now it's superb. It's also really useful if I'm opening and closing the vertical too. So that's great. Anyway, thank you very, very much everyone for listening. It's, I'm so thrilled that you've spent the time with me. Uh, today it's lovely and it gives me meaning in my life at the moment so thank you and uh, hopefully we'll see you again later thank you and hopefully see you next week bye